having covered various important issues to do with organisational responsibilities, accountabilities and accounting, we then move our attention to accountability for financial performance. So chapter seven will introduce financial accounting, again using our accountability model. Chapter eight will look at how we might record transactions in journals and ledgers. And then we'll, chapter nine will concentrate on the balance sheet. Chapter 10 on the income statement, and the statement of changes in equity. And chapter 11 will concentrate on the statement of cash flows and related cash controls. Chapter seven introduces an approach to preparing financial statements that we found very useful in explaining how transactions and events ultimately turn up within financial statements. Now in doing so, we use these tables. We're not, in chapter seven, when we're not talking about debits and credits. We do introduce chapter, in chapter eight, debits and credits, and we use an approach which proved very successful in sort of making it a lot easier for students to, to understand debits and credits. That's something that students often stumble with. And I think the approach we adopt in the book really made it a lot easier. Now, a point to be made here is that some people using the book have elected not to do, not to use chapter eight. They don't want to go into debits and credits and the book works very well without. So whether you use chapter eight in, in teaching is really whether you want to go into debits and credits. Chapter nine then drills down on the balance sheet. And again, we'll explain how transactions and events ultimately get to the balance sheet in describing the balance sheet, we'll, we'll also talk about some of the limitations of balance sheets and some of the pitfalls associated with the information in the balance sheet. We'll, we'll talk about how some important resources of an organisation aren't in the balance sheet. And we'll talk some of the, about some of the different measurement approaches to do with assets and liabilities and, and perhaps the strengths and weaknesses of some of those measurement approaches. Chapter 10, 10 then concentrates on the income statement and the statement of changes in equity. We'll talk about how accounting numbers in those reports are often used in contractual arrangements. We'll talk about the, the relevance of measures like financial profits to not-for-profit organisations. We'll talk about how profit measures often focus on short-term performance. And we'll talk about how we've got to be careful comparing profits of one period with profits of another, because we'll explain that accounting methods you know, often change. So accounting standards change and that will influence the measures of profits. So we'll, we'll talk about that. And chapter 11 concentrates on the statement of cash flows. And we'll also talk about cash, various cash controls. Chapter seven looks at the qualitative characteristics of useful financial information in some depth. But what we also talk about in that chapter is how a lot of these qualitative characteristics, you know, the fundamental qualitative characteristics of relevance and faithful representation, and then the enhancing qualitative characteristics, comparability, verifiability, timeliness, and understandability, have relevance not just to financial information, but also to other types of information, like social information, environmental information, sustainability related information. That is, we show that these qualitative characteristics of useful information really can be applied to all forms of information. This is an example of the, the tabular approach we use in chapter seven to show how certain transactions and events can be recorded and then how, you know, what the balance, how the related balance sheets might look, the related uh, income statements might look. And we find that this sort of approach was fairly easily understood by the students. This is again, another example of what we were doing in chapter seven in trying to uh, analyze transactions and then show how that flows through to the financial statements. As I've already noted, in chapter eight, we do introduce debits and credits and we go through the accounting equation and we do it in a way that we've found 
can then lead to students better understanding debits and credits. But that's in chapter eight. Again, as I said before, um, some instructors who use the book have, have elected not to go into this depth. Again, that, that's a matter of choice. Reflecting what we think is, is a very logical structure that we've used to develop this book, the final chapter concludes with the discussion of various tools to assess the reports we've already been discussing. So we, again, the, the, the book starts with our first module that looks at accounting and accountabilities and explores those in depth. Then it talks about management accounting, then leads to financial reports, which, which come after plans have been implemented. We've talked about social reports, which also are generated, and, and environmental reports and sustainability reports, which are generated after uh, management's undertaken some certain some various actions. Then, in Chapter 12, we then introduce tools to look at the reports that have now been developed, which we've already discussed in the book. Now, in, in the, the tools we're providing the students to analyse these external reports, when we're looking at the financial reports, yeah, you know, we'll talk about accounting ratios, but we'll also explain that there's a lot of very useful and valuable information that's in the notes to the financial statements. So we look at those. Now, when we're looking at what sort of tools we might use for evaluating social and environmental or sustainability reports. I'm, I've actually drawn on a lot of the experience I've gained as a judge on sustainability reporting awards. So for about a decade, I was a judge on, on some leading sustainability reporting awards. So I brought some of that across and put that in, in the book. The chapter will also explore um, third party assurance reports, audit reports and, and the value of having those. And the book will conclude, okay, so right at the end of the book, we conclude by asking students or getting the students to reflect on how their view of accounting and accountability has changed as a result of reading this book. And when we've done this with real people in front of us, and we have, we've, we've, we've done these sort of little surveys at the end after we've used this book, and we do see that the views of the students has changed. And, and you know, although it might sound odd to say this, they do find accounting fascinating, necessary and exciting. And they see it as a, students can see it as a, view, as a vehicle, accounting as a vehicle for advancing the needs and expectations of different groups of stakeholders. So, it's, so Anyway, hopefully this presentation I've just provided you has given you some um, feeling for what's in the book. And hopefully you get an idea of the passion that went into this project. It wasn't just about writing another book. It was about writing a book we thought was necessary.